Okay, so I have a question from Rachel Hayden. Rachel, of course, is not just a patron. Uh, Rachel is a collaborator with me. Uh, I highly recommend the two uh, Voices with Reveki that I've done with Rachel. Um, I'm currently working with a bunch of people to try and build a network of the uh, uh, existing and emerging communities of practice where people are trying to put into practice and into existence ecologies of practices for the cultivation of wisdom and responding to the meaning crisis. And there's a lot of these communities emerging and Rachel is doing one of these. Um, and so uh, I recommend uh, watching the two videos. Now, Rachel has a long question. I'm going to read it at length and I'll try and comment it, on it as best I can. Hello, following up on your answer last month about mood and transjectivity, I'm considering how mood in art combined with ambiguity might enhance one's transjective capacity for meaning making. I just want to pause there and uh, put a pin in the idea of ambiguity because I was I was talking with Bruce Alderman and uh, Lehman Pascal. It's a video that's going to come out on uh, Integral Stage um, about uh, ambiguity uh, within spirituality. Um, I was talking when I was talking with the uh, uh, who was I talking? I'm trying to remember. Uh, I think it, uh, Paul was there. I think it was with the two Pauls. I'm not sure. Um, Sorry, I've just done a whole bunch of amazing conversations and they all were irrelevant to each other. And so my poor, uh, you know, homo erectus brain is trying to keep them all distinct. But, I, I, you know, I was talking about the four L's that we need to return uh, to the four L's. I think it was with the two Pauls. Um, uh, and I call it talking about God before we're talking about God. But these are the four L's that are at the core of our phenomenology and our cognitive agency, but they are the four that have been identified with God. So uh, love, obviously God is agape, uh, light, logos, and life, and really trying to unpack them. And I was talking also about, um, uh, when I was talking with Bruce and Lehman, about if you really pay attention, if we're really honest and careful, and full of care and wonderful, full of wonder about these phenomena, uh, we realize something really important about them, which is their profound ambiguity. Um, I, I, I won't go into this depth, but let me just give you the gist of what I'm talking about. So if you ask people what contributes most to meaning in life, they'll tell you their love relationships, romantic and otherwise. And then when you ask them what causes the most suffering in their life, they'll tell you their love relationships. Now, that's a pretty strong, right, account of the ambiguity of love. And, you know, life will have that and so will light understood as intelligibility and so will logos. Um, and part of why I, I, I was on about that was I was pointing out the, the sort of what I'm calling the second reading of non-theism. The first reading of non-theism is that the, the shared set of presuppositions um, uh, held by both the theist, the common theist, um, and the atheist are rejected uh, in non-theism, and talked about that uh, already. But then there's the second reading, the second sailing. I'm, I'm sort of uh, copying Plato here, um, where you go deeper, which is to take very seriously. John Hicks' argument, maybe not his purely Kantian formulation of it, but John Hicks' argument that if you take a look at the uh, irresolvable debate between the religious and the non-religious, which is right now cashed out, or maybe the secular, I don't know what you say, but it, we're right now cashed out as the debate between the theists and the atheists, we have the fact that these debates are interminable. They're irresolvable. We can't, we can't come to any conclusion about them. So rather than thinking about evidence for or against the existence of God, John Hick does this brilliant move of moving up and say, what we have evidence for is about the quality of the evidence. What's non-controversial is the evidence of the, that we have, right, is best described this way. The universe is spiritually ambiguous. The universe is spiritually ambiguous. And non-theism tries to resist a deeper presupposition, the presupposition that goes back even to ancient Egypt, 
right? And civilization here and the desert on the core, which is to equate um, the sacred uh, with order and then, right, to regard and to put towards the periphery the indeterminate, the, the disordered. And one of the hallmarks of postmodernism, especially Derrida, is a critique of exactly the futility of that attempt to try to marginalize, marginalize the ambiguous and the indeterminate and try to claim that we could get a complete perfection of intelligibility. And so non-theism takes that, rejects that, and says, no, no, what we should conclude is the spiritual ambiguity of the universe and that we need right relationship to that by having an appropriate place for ambiguity within our spiritual practice. Why did I say all that? Uh, because of what Rachel now goes on to say. One of the hallmarks of great art is often a sense of ambiguity regarding the interpretation of the art. And not only of great art, of great figures. And I, and I don't mean this as an insult. I hope this is now clear. I find, and this is, this is what was said of Socrates. He was atipos. There's a profound ambiguity but not an, like, not an ambiguity in, 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 in the sense of just vague, homogenous unclarity, but a multifacetedness so that you can't settle on any one complete or finalized interpretation. Uh, so that sense of ambiguity regarding the interpretation of the art, sort of a positive analog to equivocation, which rather than creating bullshit, allows for the developmental play of thoughts, emotion, etc. Exactly. Exactly. So people have been for millennia drawing from the well of Socrates, drawing from the well of Jesus, drawing from the well of Muhammad, and it doesn't run dry, but they have not been merely repeating themselves. And there's something about these figures and great works of art and great sacred symbols um, that um, is acknowledging that the deepest, the deepest facets of our conformity to the depths of reality, love, light, logos, and life, have ambiguity sown within them. Um, and that we should stop trying to marginalize that and instead orient upon it. Um, and I think that's really important. So to continue on with Rachel's excellent question. So for instance, one could focus on the process of creating a musical mood which promotes a sensibility of transjective meaning uh, for an extraordinary example, the mysterious enchantment of Debussy's Claire de Lune, combined with lyrics that maintain a sense of ambiguous but devoted questioning, questing rather than only finished propositions. This is a fantastic proposal. I mean, this is why you need to pay attention to Rachel. This is this is this is brilliant. It goes towards the discussion I was having with Layman and Brendan Brendan uh, uh, Graham Dempsey about stopping. We now have the technology. I sound like an advertisement for the six million dollar man. Uh, for those of you who are old enough, you'll know what the reference is. For the rest of you, look it up, right? Um, that we have the technology where we do we can create like we can create art collectively and dynamically. Um, and so and 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 have visual and auditory art, and then. Uh, overlapping with the kind of unfoldment that happens in Dialogos, and we can get this multi-dimensionality of resonance. Um, we are at the place where we can not just make new sacred art, we can make new kinds of sacred art. And we need to realize that, that we need to realize that potential as profoundly as we can. Keep going. This could be one version of the art that would fit into a scalable religion of no religion. Yes. Uh, focusing on process rather than an artistic statement or expression. Exactly. Exactly, Rachel. I can't do this. I have no musical talent. Um, the only art I have, uh, I, I have any sort of experience and expertise. I've been writing poetry for about three decades. The people I allow to read it say it's, it's good. So I, I'm, I, that's not, I'm just, that's the one place where I have a sense of art and how it affords um, a conversation um, with uh, 
the depths of the psyche and, and the depths of the world. Uh, but like we need, we, I'm calling <laughs> to the artists. Like we need to pick up this potential and we need to turn it uh, like a metanoia. We need to turn it towards uh, the deepest possible addressing uh, 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 of the meaning crisis. Um, after listening to your trilogy with Brendan Graham Dempsey and Layman Pascal, which I just referred to, which was very helpful, I also think that such a contextualized presentation of ambiguity could promote symbolic variations in a way that is safely rooted in participatory knowing. I could not have said it any better. I could not have said it any better. That is fantastic. I'm going to say it again. A contextualized presentation of ambiguity could promote symbolic variation and in a way that is safely rooted in participatory knowing. We would get to, we, like, there isn't a fifth P of knowing, but there's a, there is a fifth P. It's not a form of knowing. It's a, it's a dwelling. This is, this is the place where knowing and not knowing interpenetrate. It is, it is the place of the paradox. It's where ambiguity becomes paradox and opens us into what is, right, what is transpropositional, what is the deepest transformation possible within participatory knowing. Uh, and this is what uh, Rachel is talking about. And I think we should... Uh, we should continue uh, doing that. I'm just trying to get a little bit farther down on the question here. Now, the whole question is actually on my screen. So maybe we go down a bit. Uh, yeah. Oh, I, I, I guess that's it. I guess that's it. Um, I, I think what Rachel is proposing, um, I thought there was a bit more, I'm sorry. Uh, I think is, I wanted to spend so much time on it. it it's a profound question. It's a profound proposal. Um, and, and, and I, I don't mean this in any kind of uh, irreligious or sacrilegious way. It's prophetic. This is what we need to be doing. I, this is not something I can do. All I can do is call out to the people who can and could do it. And um, so I wanted to thank Rachel for that. I think that was, that was, that was really important. 